Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect podcast, episode 21. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. So we have our two hosts today. We're missing Sebastian. Sebastian is still abroad, and I think he's settling back, but he should join us soon. So Rick and myself will be hosting this podcast. We're going to get right into the, uh, the mix of things. I just wanted to quickly mention that last week's episode, episode 20, was about Cardano 1.5. And I received a lot of comments in the YouTube section and on my YouTube channel talking about when is Cardano 1.5 coming to Daedalus. And I can't, I can't find the download for that particular version. It hasn't come out for Daedalus yet. It will eventually, and that will be broadcasted to the community. The purpose of that episode was to talk about the exchanges, talk to the exchanges and inform them that they're going to have to upgrade their API to version one in order for ADA to continue working seamlessly. Um, as far as the user, if you're if your funds, if you're ADAs in Yodoi or in Daedalus, you are good to go. Yodoi is going to upgrade to Cardano 1.5 and in Daedalus, you're gonna be able to upgrade to 1.5. So that being said, that's about that. Um, I also wanna mention that the IOHK Summit is in April, so you can go ahead and visit iohksummit.io and purchase your tickets. There are a lot of special guests, and it's it's going to be a pretty interesting time. So with that being said, I want to preface this by saying that none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice or should be taken as such. You are your best financial advisor, and if you don't think you are, find someone who's qualified to do so. So Rick, how are you doing today? What's going on? Doing great, Philippe. Thanks for asking. And I want to remind our viewers, the podcast is available on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud on AudioCast. Uh, there's also one other reminder I was going to put out, and that is there, there is no Daedalus app available on the Android Google Play store on Google Play. And if you ever did download that app, make sure you delete it because there have been users who reported that they've lost ADA through a malicious app that was downloaded from the Play Store. So please make sure that you do not have that app installed. And if you used it, then I would personally, if I were the one using it, I would move my funds. Uh, again, no, not financial advice, but that is technical advice. This program does not do financial advice, but for technical purposes, we like to protect our users. So when we find out about scams and, um, problematic activities out there, malicious activities, we like to make sure you're aware. So again, there is no Daedalus app on the Play Store. If you ever downloaded it, make sure you delete it and make sure you move your funds to a new wallet so that they do not get stolen. And uh, thank you, Tommy from Aidattainment for helping clarify that with me on Telegram. Telegram, I appreciate your help. All right, so on to our special guest today. Today, we have gentlemen from the company Tesseract here with us. We have Mr. Daniel Lepping and Mr. Gilad Waxman. So, gentlemen, I'd like to pass the mic over to you. And what we'd like to do, since our, our viewers, we don't know a lot about Tesseract, but let's start with yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Daniel and I, uh, basically, we're coming from a very different background. And we met in very in a very unusual circumstances in the past. We know each other already for uh, four, five years. Uh, uh, since 2013, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, basically, I'll start with myself. I'm um, I'm basically an entrepreneur. I started my uh, entrepreneurship uh, when I was probably 21 started totally with low-tech activities, uh, retail, wholesale, a lot of boxes, a lot of um, physical goods. Um, and uh, at a certain point uh, in my life when I was doing that, uh, I had the chance to speak to some, some very smart people from the high-tech industry uh about where the world is going to i was totally out of technology was uh, not well i was a gadget freak but not not exactly a, a technological person at, at all um 
And I started gathering information mostly about, uh, mostly about retail and where things are going and about technology and where the world is going. And, I, and it freaked me out. It freaked me out into a point of where I've made a decision uh, approximately seven, eight years ago that I'm going to ditch uh, pretty big activities, low tech activities, slowly, slowly going to sell my companies, going to sell my uh, low tech companies. And I'm going to move myself into a place where, first of all, is uh, felt much more secure to be, which is in the future of the whole industry. And also um, felt like it's a good opportunity for me to make this combination between low tech and high tech. So I started a startup that was uh, somewhere in uh, somewhere around 2011. It was the first time I started the startup. It was the first time I was actually engaging with technology and computers and designs and UI and UX, etc. Um, and uh, this startup uh, kind of uh, grew pretty fast. It, it had its own, I don't know, momentum in a sense. And um, the funny story about how I met uh, Daniel in this startup was that Daniel came out of a totally other environment. He was in a heck of an entrepreneur of himself, coming from uh, spending uh, his uh, last few years before meeting me in Ukraine. And Daniel, if you want to continue from here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that was, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Gilad. Uh, this is exactly the moment uh, about which I would love uh, to tell the story myself. Uh, it was uh, it was a crazy part of uh, my life when uh, I met Gilad. Uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, before that, I was uh, doing business in Ukraine. Well, um, I'll need to make a step back here and tell a little bit of myself. Uh, I'm an Israeli, but I was not born uh, in Israel. I was born in Ukraine, still in the times of the Soviet Union, and my parents brought me when I was a little kid uh, to Israel. And uh, after the Soviet Union broke down, uh, I kept connection with both countries. And actually, I was doing business in both countries. Uh, my late, uh, my last uh, thing that I was doing by then uh, was a consulting business based in Crimea with, uh, well, it got uh, quite some good traction. And uh, in Israel, in Tel Aviv, I was uh, mainly doing business development uh, and worked with uh, Israeli companies. Uh, but the team was in uh, Crimea, uh, most of the staff and most of the developers. Uh, so... There was a moment in 2013 when I went uh, back to Israel, uh, like for several months. Uh, and while I was there, uh, the event with Crimea happened with uh, an, an action of uh, the Crimean Peninsula and Ukraine. And when, when the government changed and uh, there was a, some sort of revolution and Suddenly, uh, when I was in Tel Aviv, I realized that uh, my bank accounts are suddenly closed, like frozen, um, all my credit cards don't work, nothing works. I was not really following that much that events, but suddenly when you cannot get cash from an ATM, uh, you have to follow what's going on. And uh, the thing is that most of my funds were by then uh, in Crimea. And uh, I had to do something. Like I'm standing in the middle of Tel Aviv on the street and realizing, uh, well, I'm in, a, I'm in a position, I would say. Uh, so when I was thinking what to do, I, uh, well, the only option to get funds fa fast by then to get around the situation somehow was to find a job. And uh, one of the first jobs uh, that I found was Gilad's startup, Shop Cloud which honestly speaking, I entered because, well, I needed salary by then. Only later I realized how amazing people I've met there and I was so glad that I joined it, but it was later. So uh, this is pretty much how we met with Gilad in a, not the best time of my life, but uh, well, I was happy it was going on. It was a part 
One thing that uh, it's very important to talk about, which uh, uh, we have a third partner, which is not here, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, I think we should tell a little bit about this guy. Yeah. Because he's yeah. a special yeah. one. Sure. He's our CTO. And uh, uh, let, me, let me tell this a yeah. story, please. I really okay. want to do this. Uh, okay. Basically, the third partner of ours uh, is a guy with whom uh, I'm working already for like, uh, 10 years and uh, we share a lot of history together we were working on many stuff together basically his first job was my first company and uh, this is where we met we, uh, he worked there for several years then he uh, wanted to try some things on his own tried some successfully some failures as everyone and then we started to get back uh, together again, and it proceeded further, further, further. Uh, and uh, well, to say the least, he is probably the smartest, uh, smartest guy in our team. Oh, that's and, for sure. Uh, I wish uh, he could have joined uh, this podcast, uh, but unfortunately, he's too busy with the real work. Is he the software engineer? Yeah, he's a software engineer with a vast background. Uh, yeah. Okay. I totally understand. <laughs> I'm not a software engineer, but my coworkers are, and they're always really busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually he is in a state of mind, just don't disturb me, guys. Let me do what I'm doing. And he's the kind of guy that would rather prefer to concentrate on the deliverables and uh, the product and what really brings value rather than talks around that. And uh, probably this is exactly what he's doing right now, sitting and finishing the next version. Daniel, I want I want to say that um, that was a pretty um, thank you for sharing that those experiences and um, it it the the previous episode that we had with uh, Alan Vermner, it, it really brought to light the issues with monetary sovereignty and being able to access and hold your funds that's a right that every single person should have and i can just imagine how terrifying that experience could be just having your funds frozen we hear about it happening all around the world all the time but as americans rick we're kind of shielded from it we just hear it and we brush it off but there's no guarantee that it doesn't happen to us one day you know, it has happened in previous, it has happened historically. You know, America is the biggest country and it has the most power and influence over the world, but it, we're, we're one step away from facing those issues as well. It almost so, happened in 2008. Yes, that is true. That is yeah. true. Pretty close that. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. So Rick, did you want to segue to Tesseract and figure out exactly um, maybe we can talk about the Emergo Accelerator program. I wanted to bring that up. Um, basically, the Emergo Accelerator program was vetting a lot of different, I would say, startups. Please correct me if I'm if I'm I'm speaking incorrectly. And they're looking for. I took it straight off from the website. The Accelerator program is looking to decentralize the world's data, empower individuals, tokenize financial instruments, and explore new use cases for blockchain technology. And apparently they interviewed and had discussions with plenty of companies and they chose four companies to, to bring into this accelerator program. And Tesseract was one of these companies. So they have a partnership with Emergo and I believe it's a 14 week program. Could you tell us more about that program and what exactly you did to get, become part of it? Again, what, what happened is that uh, one night Daniel decided to just come and visit me in Tel Aviv and we were sitting in Tel Aviv. It was really, uh, I don't know if it was two or three o'clock at night. Uh, and I knew nothing about blockchain except of the fact that people are talking about it and talking Bitcoin. Uh, and Daniel uh, has a very, um, a very good way of how to explain a technology, but not just from the technological perspective, but again, also from the value perspective. And I think that uh, me, again, as an entrepreneur, I was very, as I said, I was very low tech up until seven, eight years ago. The reason why I crossed this 
bridge uh, for becoming a high-tech entrepreneur is exactly because of the looking for this freedom. And when Daniel explained me deeply that night uh, about uh, decentralized, uh, about the, the whole blockchain world and, and where he expects that this technology will be going, I was actually, hang, I just uh, grabbed my head uh, telling myself, that's it, I need to right now, again, reshuffle, stop everything, and reassess what I'm going to do uh, further on, because I felt that exactly like Daniel, it's, uh, it's, uh, we feel like it's a piece of history, and it's a piece of the freedom of people, which we really want to take part of. We didn't know back then how we want to take part of but we just just knew and felt that it's the right thing to do. And we had a, this kind of an immediate bond uh, of let's do it together. It, it was exactly like this in, in the same night. It wasn't like a few weeks of thinking about it. It was the same night and we made a heck big decisions that night. Daniel, if you remember. Uh, it was a very passionate talk, I would say. Uh... Gilad was looking for something new, for some new food for thought, for some new uh, things to do in business. And uh, I was passionate by then very much about uh, blockchain and uh, how it evolves so far and what can this technology bring us. Uh, so this was uh, the talk in general about the opportunities, the possibilities, the dreams, how big can it get and uh, how much can we do with it uh well that was that was a long talk i think we were staying till uh, the middle of the night like 3 a.m probably and uh but it, it was a very good talk it was actually a decision making talk this is one of the talks after which you feel with the guts uh you have uh you have a partner already you think the same way you look at the uh at the same direction and we started exploring the opportunities of what exactly now can we do together uh one of uh, one of the things that uh, we started doing we were looking for the right partners like with whom to do that to whom to talk who is more experienced in blockchain and already is uh deeply in that market and one of the companies was uh, in the list was a Morgo. So, well, with the Morgo, it started uh, amazingly. It started with a, just a cold uh, email. And uh, uh, after we sent this cold email, we already almost forgot that it probably a couple of weeks passed. Uh, but suddenly we get a reply like, yeah, sure, guys, let's talk. Let's explore the opportunity. And uh, we started exploring the opportunity. Uh, the initial thought about Tesseract, uh, it was not the name by then even. Uh, we thought of bringing uh, to Cardano thing uh, from Ethereum world, which is called MetaMask. And uh, in Ethereum communities, it's an, it's an essential piece of the infrastructure. And most of the decentralized applications are used with uh, MetaMask. Uh, so we got the good feedback about that uh, from Emurgo, like, yeah, sure, it's an amazing thing, let's think about it. And by then we were uh, calling the project like Meta Cardano or Cardano Mask or whatever. Uh, totally not Tesseract, Tesseract came uh, as a name way later. Uh, but what we saw also at the same time, what didn't feel right about that, uh, that uh, it's a little bit limited because uh, we were looking at the graphs of the downloads of MetaMask and initially it's amazing, it was growing, but it, it was stopping to grow. Like we felt there is uh, some sort of saturation on the market and uh, we need to deal something with that. Uh, so we started talking, uh, uh, we started talking to the customers. And by the customers who we defined as customers, we didn't want to limit ourselves to decentralized applications who already are in blockchain. Uh, we started talking to the companies whose models fit decentralization very much, but who don't utilize blockchain yet. And uh, we started probing what are the barriers for them to onboard. 
everyone, well, everyone loved, yeah, sure, decentralized. We, well, we picked the good companies, of course, open-minded. But uh, while they loved the idea to go blockchain, uh, we found that there is a big number of barriers on the way to that. They are afraid because they have users, and uh, if they will put these barriers between them and their users, they, they will immediately lose their audience. That was the uh, that was the fact by then. Uh, like frankly talking, this is exactly what we were going through. And then we realized something that uh, maybe this is exactly what we should solve. Like bring a blockchain beyond its current limits and uh, solve this problem. What's often said is the, that the blockchain needs to solve a problem and you've identified a problem to be solved. You've also, you've also identified a market where like with MetaMask, it hit a point of diminishing returns uh, because yeah. of the graph you looked at. Yeah. Exactly. True. Exactly. Yeah. True. So we thought, yeah, we should, uh, we should just dream bigger and not just like, you know, create uh, uh, something for the market that already exists. Well, why not? There is uh, there is a great potential market. Okay, uh, listen. What we think right now? Blockchain does an amazing job in uh, uh, crypto uh, industry and like assets related stuff. But uh, that's not the whole story. Blockchain is an amazing technology that that is capable of way more things. Well, while we would love to bring it to everything possible, well, we chose a very simple niche for us. Uh, we uh, are focusing on solving the problems, the barriers that companies face who are oriented on the users. The companies whose software is interacting with the final user, uh, not, not educated user, not something uh, who is deeply in blockchain or uh, doing well with crypto or deeply technological. No, the people who just want to use some apps as lifestyle. Yeah. And it's also important to say that uh, from observing at the, at the younger generation, uh, I have two kids, right? Um, well, while Daniel and I and maybe our parents as well are freaks of freedom, uh, I see that the young generation is uh, less capable of, of paying attention to the problems uh, on, on the way of their behavior today uh, and they don't see the lack of freedom that is going to be down the road if the system is not going to change so the internet has to change in a way uh, while they don't understand it you know we actually see it as a great mission not not only of tesseract but of our generation i think to to bring the internet to the place where it's supposed to be and uh, it was very easy for me to understand uh, even in the beginning when i spoke to daniel and i think this is what attracted me because uh, yeah daniel is maybe more of a freedom freak than i am because maybe of different life circumstances or maybe i'm just a little bit blind sometimes uh is that it's just something that needs to change not only the way that finance behaves not only the way that uh, that uh, countries uh, uh, you know it's it's not it's not only a matter of of your assets it's also a matter of your your privacy and your other belongings which are uh, right now if you look at the younger generation they belong to big companies we don't want to say the names we all know the names which actually control it with their own servers which I see as a big problem. Uh, so I think Tesseract is just, uh, uh, from our perspective, we just want to kind of take this amazing technology and, and just bring it to the rest of the applications out there, uh, which we're not even thinking about, maybe. I don't think we're thinking about the, the amount of applications that can be used if the right, uh, if the right solution for those barriers that Daniel was mentioned, which we really hit the wall with those barriers with the companies that we talked to. Solving that is, is, is bigger than just, oh, now we can decentralize the application. It's, it's 
what type of application there will be in the future. How can people put their data on those applications? How they can keep their, you know, their belongings to themselves and not, et cetera, et cetera. All right, thank you very much for that, Jalad. Now, next I want to get into the main question, and that is, what is Tesseract going to build for the Cardano ecosystem? Well, uh, the timing is the first version of uh, Tesseract will probably go out this spring. And, uh, well, if we will be releasing something uh, before Cardano has smart contracts, uh, yeah, we want to experiment with the market and bring it back to the Cardano community. We want to learn from other networks experience, bring it back. So this is one of the parts. And uh, uh, if uh, talking about the deliverables, yeah, there will be some client side software like applications to download. Of course, we are right now working with blockchain around wallets, even though, well, maybe it's a questionable concept, I don't know. Maybe we should work around keychains, some sort, like a key, your personal key, and that's it. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a story for the, for the other discussion. Anyways, there will be a wallet, uh, and the wallet will have capabilities uh, to deal with the applications on, well, ideally we want to do it on any platform possible, on all mobile platforms uh, and on all the desktop platforms. Uh, utilizing same tools, same SDKs, uh, to make it very easy and simple for developers to onboard using what they are comfortable to use. If I mentioned briefly that we started with the talks with the Morgo, like let's bring MetaMask uh, from Ethereum world to Cardano world also. Uh, so let me please uh, talk a little bit more about that. So what's MetaMask? Uh, MetaMask is a browser plugin that allows your browser to instantly become blockchain enabled. Your browser, since you install the plugin, can simply run blockchain applications. With MetaMask, it's true for Ethereum. We want to make the same for Cardano. So your browser with the Tesseract plugin will be capable of uh, running Cardano-based applications. Simple as that. But the thing is that, again, uh, taking in consideration our story of uh, how we went through it, exploring the companies that would love to go to blockchain but face uh, a lot of barriers of adoption, of user experience of blockchain and all that stuff, uh, we want to go a little bit farther. First thing that I want to uh, tell that for sure, uh, one of the products in our line is... Uh, the same stuff for mobile devices, which is uh, bringing a unique experience of enjoying a UX of a native application on mobile, uh, but with blockchain behind it. And uh, all our products will be mobile first, that's for sure. Uh, so uh, you will be able to enjoy Cardano-based blockchain applications on mobiles on web on desktop wherever you prefer <laughs> wherever you prefer to enjoy it uh and uh but that's not the end actually that's not the end of the story there are more barriers to uh, to start using blockchain for businesses and uh as a little sneak peek uh well it's it's a little bit early to talk about the actual products and the actual solutions uh how we solve that we would like to keep it uh, privately for now, but there's a little sneak peek. Uh, I can tell you, well, one of the problems, let's say, try to build a sophisticated application based on smart contracts, and suddenly you realize that your users have to pay gas for every single button click. Big issue, big problem. Uh, so this is one of the things we tackle on, and there is much more. So with a uh, how Tesseract evolves, you will be seeing more and more applications. We are talking to quite some companies uh, who would love to onboard, who are waiting for our product releases with uh, these, at least, barriers solved. So we will be seeing more and more applications providing a smooth experience for the user uh, without all this hustle of onboarding, go there, buy uh, that uh, on exchange, and then transfer it backwards, forwards, 
make it simple, make life simple and make blockchain based applications a lifestyle. That was a great response. I have a quick question to ask you because you were speaking about this before, this whole idea of trying to decentralize certain apps and making sure that privacy is of concern and um, users that are inputting their information, they're protected. So what kind of, when you're speaking of companies that you're speaking with, what categories are these companies in? Because a lot of the apps that we use on our phone, whether that be Facebook or Instagram or all the major apps, they're run by centralized companies that really don't have any initiative to become decentralized. So what kind of apps are looking for these decentralized um, solutions in this, in this ecosystem? Like what kind of category of those apps? Sure, well, very good question actually, very legit question, and I would love to answer it. Uh, so first of all, uh, the thing is that uh, there are quite some, without mentioning any names, but there are quite some companies and quite some applications that are decentralized by nature, that enable peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interaction of people or peer-to-peer -peer interaction of businesses or any kind of peer-to-peer -peer interaction, but they are made in a centralized, with, with just centralized technologies. But the thing is that by the nature of peer-to-peer -peer interaction, the better technology that suits their business models is actually blockchain. And uh, this is our first target. Well, of course, uh, when we talk about centralized companies, like you mentioned, uh, what I believe in, even if they don't, let's say, jump to decentralization, but there will be the, competi the competitors of theirs, competition will rise, who will come with a decentralized solution that will give them a competitive advantage over the centralized peers. I'll give you an example of what I'm thinking uh, when you say that is like gambling, because, you know, gambling is a big industry and they have to deal with centralized servers and centralized storage and control of money. This is just an example I'm throwing out there. And yeah. if you want to use a gambling dApp on my phone here and I'm like, hey, yeah, let me you know, play some poker and see if I can make a little bit of money, which is kind of, which is a fun thing to do. And yeah. they're dealing with centralized data. That's just one example. Uh, if it was more peer to peer, like. I'm in Virginia and Philippe's in Florida. And if we want to do peer-to-peer -peer poker and try to make a little bit of, you know, it's fine. We could. Yeah, for sure. Uh, this, uh, well, this is good example. Honestly speaking, that's not what exactly I had in my head when I was talking about the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interaction uh, within some sort of system. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of gambling, but that's me. Uh, but what the example that you brought is amazing. Actually, this is one of the things. Yeah, for sure. You don't have to have, uh, you, you don't have to be connected to a central authority, the judges who wins the game, right? There are just rules and, uh, you interact peer to peer. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to give the viewers a concrete example because they might be getting tired of my taco stories. Like if I want to go to Taco Bell and buy me a taco, I just, I want to buy it. <laughs> I use my phone to do that in crypto. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I uh, totally understand you. Uh, so uh, <laughs> if you want to buy a taco, uh, well, you're talking more about the crypto and money and assets. Uh, while uh, we are very supportive about that in Tesseract, I believe that there is a lot of people dealing with uh, internet money and decentralized money at the moment. And we just don't want to be one more in the crowd. Instead, we chose a little bit different area to solve. And uh, as I started our story, I believe that blockchain can solve so much more problems than decentralization of money. And for sure, uh, money is now the killer app on the blockchain. <laughs> but uh, come on, there can be more. It's like saying, okay, the internet, well, in the early days of the internet saying, okay, the internet is about sending emails. To take your example even further, when if you're buying a taco from Taco Bell on a mobile app, I mean, there's an exchange of information. So even if you're like not buying a taco and you're just providing information to Taco Bell, they know where you live, they know probably how old you are, what demographic you are, maybe your salary range, 
maybe making sure that this information is a little bit more private and both parties can benefit from a mutual transaction of information. So you party A are giving up some information to Taco Bell and Taco Bell is guarding your information and using that for a particular purpose and maybe not storing it on a centralized server and selling your information to a thousand other companies to solicit you. Um, I, I don't think know that's, that's, that's an amazing example, I think, of what Daniel was, uh, was actually saying, that it's not only about paying with, uh, with your crypto, it's about the way that you actually uh, interact with the other side of the, the, the peer to peer. The other side of the, of the fence is actually how it uses the information. Exactly what you're saying, companies are actually taking advantage of those things. They're sharing the information, they're sharing your data, whether you like salsa or you like uh, whatever it is in your taco. And this is exactly the point. The point is that it's not only the killer app of, of the money transfer, it's also the data, the information, uh, you know, being able to know that we are creating a better, a better internet, just a better internet. Uh, that's, that's how I can think about it with my less technological background uh, of how I want to see things happening because it's, uh, it's just right now, you don't know what you're doing when you're opening an app. You don't know where the information is going, where uh, it's everything, where you are, how old are you, uh, whether you're rich or poor, whether whatever. Uh, I think that's a private uh, a privacy issue, which is just going to get worse and worse during the years. And here comes the blockchain here to give us some light and, uh, and enable us to build just better, better infrastructure for applications, uh, which are part of our lives. That's it. It's not just playing uh, games. It's also uh, order and, you know, if I order a taxi, I don't want anyone to know that I'm taking my Uber from one place to another and then back and then what was my plan? He went to McDonald's or he went to this? Uh, I think Daniel, correct me if I'm right, but this is what you meant about the 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 rest of the benefits that you can get from uh, the example of uber that you brought is uh well yeah it's classic what what can i say uh, i believe if uh, they will not adapt uh, decentralization one day then uh, the next day the competition appears that will just implement it uh instead of them it's peer-to-peer -peer. this is a good example yeah, this is a good example, for instance. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. And if anyone's not familiar with how much data people are tracking, just go to Google Timeline. And if you have an Android phone, if you have Google running on your phone, whether you're running iOS or you're running an Android phone, it maps every single step you take. It tells you whether you're walking, you're cycling, uh, you're riding in a car. It's, it's very invasive, and that information is being shared with other parties. So please understand that. Think yeah. about, think about the, all of the health applications. Right now, the health applications, it's just growing bigger and bigger, and we see more and more people that are actually gathering their data, their information about their health. It's something very private, if you think about it. You don't want it to be running around to companies that are selling drugs. Uh, yeah, I think privacy and freedom go hand in hand because with privacy comes your ability to decide what information you want to expose and to whom you expose it and what information you want to withhold because you own that data and that's just part of what freedom is. And with a lot of these centralized services, the trade-off of using them is, <clears throat> okay, if I want to use something for free, what do they want from me? I become the product. I give them all my personal data and they use that for marketing. And it's it's out there through the internet. You know, if you want to find out, just Google yourself. Although I like to use Bing. So Bing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bing is my favorite. Or, or Duck, Duck, Go yourself. <laughs> you probably won't come up with anything because Duck, Duck, Go is a privacy browser, but that's beside the point. So you guys, are you'll, you'll make apps that run on cell phones and one other thing I want to touch on for our viewers, because dApps came up a few times, and I think you guys, you might understand what a dApp is a lot better than I do. I've looked at some dApps on MetaMask, 
and some that run on Ethereum Classic, like there's investment dApps that they have that are pretty neat. Um, what is the difference between an app and a dApp? What is the clear, can you clearly break that out for me? Uh, so listen, uh, actually the difference is uh, very simple. DApp is pretty much any application of any kind that utilizes decentralized technologies behind. That's it, nothing else. So once any application moves to blockchain, it becomes a DApp. I think it's important to emphasize here that when we are talking about uh, decentralized, we're talking about the fact that there is no, uh, and, uh, I don't know who are the listeners, but there, there, there is no uh, uh, basically a server, a centralized server, which is sitting in some company's uh, uh, hub and uh, being controlled by, uh, by it. Uh, yeah. It's yes. important to understand. Uh, well, that. there are okay. traits of the apps that I would like uh, to talk about. Uh, again, blockchain is something that is run by the community. It's not uh, running by a central authority. And let's say if uh, more than 51% of nodes reject a new version of something, well, it's a problem. And uh, well, we have seen it before, the forking, uh, the hard forking of uh, networks uh, that happen. Good example, maybe Ethereum Classic. Uh, like uh, where part of the community didn't want to go with a certain update and part of the community wanted to proceed with it. That's it. Uh, now we have two theorems, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. And uh, the thing is that if majority, let's say, well, I told 51% probably more, if let's say majority that supports the infrastructure behind a certain application rejects the new version, okay, then uh, the company cannot run this update if the community doesn't want it. So I wanted to transition to the Emergle D-Lab um, accelerator program. So you're one of the four companies chosen. I believe that they were looking through a long list of companies they vetted and they're looking for potential companies and startups that are going to be providing certain blockchain solutions that are gonna further the ecosystem. Can you tell us more about the accelerator program, what you had to do to get involved and just some more details so anyone, everyone can figure out exactly what's going on with that program. Feels here like back to university uh, in a very good way, in a very positive way. Uh, honestly speaking, uh, well, we came here, even though we have quite some entrepreneurial background, both of us, uh, we came here uh, with a very open mind. Like we want to learn new things and uh, actually well what is going on here in the atmosphere and the mentors and well it's, it's such a high level it's such a high level that uh, these are the people you want to talk to all the time you want to listen to them uh, to the ideas and how can they give you this perspective and another perspective and one more perspective. And uh, sometimes you feel yet like you just visited psychologist who strength, uh, straightened your mind in the right direction and you were stuck for a second, but uh, for a moment, and now you're again good to go and explore. And they, it's amazing. What can I tell? I love it, love it. Yeah. I love the experience here. It's a program for life. It's more than just uh, an accelerator for uh, our startup. It, it, just yeah. gives, it gives a lot of perspective to everything that you do, uh, everything that you believe in. Uh, you know, uh, meeting here so many amazing people. And by the way, nevertheless, amazing projects that are doing yeah are with yeah. us, uh, which we talk and then listen to each other and try to help each other uh, with suggestions and uh, contacts, etc. It's just uh, an amazing, uh, it, it's an amazing opportunity, which we are both so thankful for it, regardless to everything else. I think that we are fortunate to be chosen 
Uh, Tesseract as a project is fortunate to be uh, a part of this uh, program because it's going to be a better, a, a better company, a better uh, brand, a better in any aspect of the business. It's going to be better. But I think we're going to get out from here uh, with a better understanding of uh, not only business but also uh, perspectives about uh, life and entrepreneurship and. Uh, yeah, it's exactly like Daniel said. It's uh, it's exactly like going back to university, but it's a better university. Yeah, it's like university for grown-ups. Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> yeah, a good that's kind right. of university. And uh, well, I believe here it comes from a uh, good synergy. Uh, if we talk about the D Lab program specifically, D Lab is run uh, by two companies uh, behind. Watch one is Morgo who brought us initially and introduced us. And there is another company behind the so it's we, we, which uh, is uh, a VC who invests in startups through acceleration programs. And I believe this comes from the synergy of these two companies and uh, from the vast experience they had uh, in their own, uh, in their own uh, expertises. Yeah, and you mix it all with being in the center of, of Manhattan. Oh, yeah, the energy here around. Uh, what can I say? It's amazing. It's an amazing. amazing place to be. I'm uh, glad that uh, this happened. Uh, we are very fortunate. Told we are fortunate to be here. Yeah, yeah we're Thank very you. fortunate. So if you ask how we appeared here, uh, well, the, again, it's, uh, our history is linked a lot with uh, Emurgo and uh, our roots are coming to Cardano and Emurgo. So uh, Emurgo introduced us to D-Lab and we were talking for quite some time, actually. It was like a couple of months at least we were talking. Uh, I think Emurgo, Emurgo we, we were talking with Emurgo for a long time and I think that Emurgo was wise and smart enough to get to kind of know us uh, and understand that we are maybe grown-up entrepreneurs, but grown-up entrepreneurs that need to go back to school, in a sense. Uh, <laughs> Very true. <laughs> and, and, and they were right. They were just right. You know, it was like, I wouldn't do it any other way. It's amazing. Okay. Okay, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. I, I, from Sebastian is one of the hosts on the podcast, and from what we know about Emergo, they are really trying to find the next solutions. I mean, Emergo, IOHK, the Cardano Foundation, they're the trifecto that are working behind the Cardano project, but they're really trying to advance the space. And the fact that you were chosen means that there's definitely potential there. So moving on to both of you have mentioned that you are entrepreneurs and you are business oriented people. So going to your website, I see that you have the multi-network open wallet protocol and certain SDKs that you're going to be offering. SDKs for our audience are software development kits and you are using your using the Rust language, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and true. so are you bundling these solutions and offering them to apps that are already in the legacy system to make them decentralized? Is that your business model? Uh, let me explain. Let me explain. Uh, it's actually very simple. What you see on our site at the moment, uh, this is a solution uh, that, uh, well, right now it's a part of the, the whole story. Uh, this is uh, one of the steps that uh, we had on our path uh, when we realized, well, without, uh, without the consumer-oriented devices and consumer-oriented operating systems and platforms, well, there is no way to go further. Uh, so this was one of the things that we released to public just to try out the market, uh, you know, to try to talk to the companies that want to, uh, that have the applications, the mobile applications and, as their main uh, channel of communication with their users and want to go blockchain. Uh, so we released this particular site, which says connecting apps and wallets. Uh, this still is a part of Tesseract, 
uh, and it will stay there. And yes, we're releasing the open protocols pretty soon on how to interact with uh, how the wallets can interact with uh, the applications on mobiles. And uh, yeah, it, we wanted to make multi-protocol, that's for sure. Uh, even though uh, it goes first with uh, Cardano and we are looking forward to the moment where Cardano is going to release the main net uh, of smart contracts. Uh, we are working uh, closely with Morgo on synchronizing the dates for that. So to make it available from the very first moment, Cardano goes leave. Um, it's all here. Uh, but yeah, we're experimenting what, with what is available for the community at the moment, of course, uh, even even if uh, Cardano is our uh, network of the first choice. So segueing to the next version of your protocol when you release it, how can companies who are traditional, they have traditional legacy apps in, in the legacy system, if they want to decentralize, if they want to bring in blockchain to their company, how can they contact you? What's the, what's the process to get your protocol involved with their project? Uh, let me tell you exactly. Right now, the best way probably will be to contact us and uh, we would love to explore any individual case on the individual basis. We want to learn uh, every aspect of uh, the businesses that are behind these applications and what are the concerns and what, what may be their fears of going blockchain and decentralized. And we want to learn all these barriers. And uh, even if the first versions of Tesseract will not solve all of them, we want to learn from these guys who really are passionate to move their businesses to blockchain. And I have to accept so, uh, the next version for sure will uh, yeah. solve it. I so, have to expand from what you were just from what Daniel's saying is not that only uh, their fears to go blockchain, but uh, but also why do they want to go blockchain? Because you understand it's a, it's such such a wide variety of applications out there with so many uh, reasons why to go blockchain well you want to learn that too blockchain buddy honestly speaking i think there may be two reasons either hype or we share the same beliefs <laughs> yeah <laughs> well uh, whatever it is uh, in, in, i'm talking more in the use cases uh, scenario yeah, yeah yeah what kind of niches you mean yeah for yeah. sure uh, but regardless, uh, I think one of the most important parts of our job in Tesseract is really to learn the barriers of real world businesses, like uh, to make, to help them to get to blockchain. So uh, most probably we will, we can work on case by case on that. Yeah. Would love to. Okay. This comes from... Reddit user J Russo Ada, and this user asks, "What kind of apps slash DApps can we see from Tesseract in the future? How will smart contracting languages such as Plutus help you develop? And lastly, how will your project help better the Cardano ecosystem?" Yes, well, we were talking about that earlier, and we were talking about privacy solutions, and the the applications are broad right now, and it's more like reaching companies that are looking for blockchain solutions and looking to decentralize their systems. So I don't think there's a specific app or a specific company that you're looking at. I mean, there are certain use cases, of course, but you are definitely open and your SDK, your software development kit is going to allow for multiple use cases to become decentralized. Exactly. It's like, again, it's like in the early internet, no one knew what uh, kind of applications we will see in uh, 2000s and 2010s. No one. And it was impossible to predict. So we want to go through the same procedure and learn the same way. We would like to hear what ideas, what dreams this company have and why they are so much passionate um, about going blockchain. Like, what are the reasons? And what are the fears? How can we create the infrastructure to make this happen? Yeah, that's our mission, actually. 
That's our mission. Cool. All right. And the next question is, how will smart contracting languages such as Plutus help you develop? The language Plutus, or will it be any other language, it's more for when you develop a decentralized application on the smart contracts. Uh, while we are working on the infrastructure, we are at the moment a bit less concerned of uh, the choice of on which language develop any smart contracts if we need. Uh, so it's not a concern at the moment. Right on. So the last question, the last part of the question here was, lastly, how will your project help better the Cardano ecosystem? And I think that one was answered because you're going to enable mobile application. I want to talk about it a little bit on a higher level. I don't want to talk mobile applications. I want to talk about what kind of user we can bring. And if right now, most of the decentralized applications and the environment they work in is more suitable for blockchain educated user. The user who wants to use blockchain, who knows blockchain and is passionate about blockchain. Our dream is to bring the users that uh, don't know anything about that. They just want the applications. Like right now, when you use Google or any other search engine, you don't think internet, you just want to open your browser and type what you want to find. And this is the experience we want to bring to blockchain and specifically to Cardano community in the first place. You know, Daniel, that's absolutely brilliant. I just realized what you're getting at is you want to make it transparent to the user. The user doesn't exactly. even know it's blockchain. Exactly, that's the dream. Yeah, that's the dream. Uh, and. Uh, and that's the dream because, uh, you know, eventually that's kind of a little bit of what I said before about the users, about the young users that are not, uh, they don't care yet about their privacy. They don't know whether uh, it's being used this way or another way. I think that it's, it's, it's kind of a big and important mission and it's a big value for, uh, for the users on, and also for Cardano to lead uh, to lead uh, those kind of users that don't even know that they are actually using blockchain to use safer and better uh, applications. That's uh, I believe that any technology in uh, its early stages, and uh, everyone who loves the technology in its early stages does the same mistake. We try to teach the user how to use our technology. But uh, when the technology becomes more and more mature, uh, we start realizing that, listen, maybe we need uh, to listen to the user and observe how the user works with, uh, in uh, its native environment and then think back a little bit and uh, make our technology suitable for the behaviors of the user. And that's what we want to do. People don't think about the internet today when they use their app, their apps, you know, they just open the phone, order yeah. pizza, order Uber, whatever, but it's all around the internet is going. People so, don't yeah. think they're holding computer in their hand. Yeah. They think, okay, it's just a place where they have apps. Yeah. I don't want the users to even know what is blockchain. Yeah, because I'm guilty of doing that too. I forget that I'm holding a computer in my hand and I forget how centralized the internet is until I read a story that says 500 million user IDs were hacked from X bank or X financial institution. Then I wake up and I go, whoa, why are 500 million uh, user data being stored in something that's that hackable? And so decentralization can help solve that kind of stuff. Yeah. Hunmask88 asked also, when are they planning to have a product V1 ready to launch? We plan yeah. this spring. Spring. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. That's awesome. Pretty close. That's, yeah. That's what people like to know. They like to go, hey, when are we going to get it? So that's nice. You're willing to put Anyways, it. Uh, whoever wants to follow it uh, with a better precision is welcome to subscribe. Go to our site, send us an email, and we will uh, subscribe to everyone interested uh, to the news. And we will get that site linked on this video. All right, so the next question was, um, 
from Reddit user Kyle Bessie. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for the question. And he asks, how is the name Tesseract associated with the product? Good question. And uh, we had issues choosing the name, honestly. Uh, it's a frank truth that we went through, I don't know how many names. Hundreds. 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 I don't know. Maybe it's a bit of exaggeration. Not a big exaggeration, though. Uh, but why does Rex? Uh, well, we were thinking how to bring uh, another dimension of uh, freedom, if you know, to, to try to express it in an emotional way, how to bring another dimension of freedom. And what Tesseract is, Tesseract is uh, in math, it's the name of four dimensional cube, simple as that. So it's just, we're trying to add another dimension. No, that's great. That's a great explanation because the four dimensional cube, I had to look that up. You have it on your website and it makes a lot more sense because the first thing people think of is Loki and you know Thanos is going to try to steal the Tesseract or something. Well, like I'm very much honored to stay within this crowd, but honestly <laughs> speaking, it came from four dimensional cube. <laughs> <laughs> Right on. Okay. Uh, and the last question, this is the last one from Reddit. Uh, Reddit user WDY43BI asks, I have never even heard of Tesseract. Is there a link we can read? Everything I find is Avenger related. And then another user replied and dropped the link to your site, HTTPS getus.io. So getus, G-E-T-T-E-S is get Tesseract. Dot io. Uh, and that was it for the Reddit questions. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask this before, but I saw on your website that a lot of the, for example, the wallet, the open wallet protocol, um, the iOS SDK, the Android SDK, everything says open source. So yeah. how are you going to compete in for your business if you are open sourcing your software development kit? Isn't that um, isn't that allowing your competition to maybe take what you're doing and also implementing it with other apps, or are you fine with that? I would love for others to take what we do and implement a clone or something. It means we are doing a worthy thing. And this means we should move forward and make the next, the next, the next, the next step. I'm not afraid of this kind of competition, honestly speaking, because if something try, if someone tries to copycat, you're always one step ahead. I'm cool with this. Perfect. I think you're in the right project then associated with the right project. I mean, Cardano is all open source and everything is done with a certain level of transparency and allows yeah. for competitors to take it and he he make it better. Right, you know. <laughs> And uh, I have a technical background, as I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, uh, well, even though I code less and less and less and I uh, don't have enough time for it, I miss these times, honestly speaking. And uh, uh, this is not the first open source stuff uh, I'm doing in my life. Are you, you planning on releasing all your stuff as open source and it's going to be audited just like uh, a lot of the other Emergo, all the Emergo and yeah, OHK? For sure. For sure. Yes. Certainly, the critical parts that are uh, security uh, related uh, will be fully audited. That's for sure. So, um, on your on your site, you have something that says the open standard of communication between the wallets and the applications, and you mentioned something about implementation for wallet apps and hardware wallets. So, in the future, could Tesseract be working with hardware wallet companies like Trezor or Ledger or whatever future hardware wallets are? Could you use your SDK and could they implement them within their apps or within their programs? Is that what you mean by hardware wallets? Uh, what we think, how we think about wallets in uh, the context of applications. Uh, the wallet is the place where you sign the transaction when the application. Uh, let's take some example. Let's say it's a collectible game and you want to buy something collect uh, collectible. Uh, eventually, it opens your wallet and asks you if you want to sign the transaction, right? 
Uh, so in this context, why does it matter if this is a software wallet or it's a hardware wallet? And yeah, we are working uh, on that to make it possible uh, not to interact only with software wallets, but rather provide a way how with the same protocol, uh, it can be signed by a hardware wallet, like directly to the application. Okay, I understand, I understand. Rick, I think that I'm exhausted with questions. I, I think I exhausted my list and um, I don't know if you wanted, if you had any last minute questions, we went over the Reddit questions. If not, we can start to wrap up this episode. What do you think, Rick? I think I'm exhausted too and so is everybody else. <laughs> and most people don't watch the episodes till the end and I'm leaving that in there. But <laughs> just so for wrap up here, before we go on, you know, I want to make sure to point out, Philippe and I are both wearing Emergo t-shirts. We don't work for Emergo. We just got T-shirts because I kind of like, you know, finagled getting some T-shirts. They're really cool. They don't sell them. And I was like, man, we got to get some because I liked Sebastian's Emergo T-shirt. So that's the only reason why we have them is because I managed to kind of finagle them. And that's it. Okay. So, and I'm not going to tell you how either. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully you guys can get some Virgo t-shirts because they are oh, pretty cool oh we have yeah. actually it's a little bit too cold in new york these days you know to walk around in t-shirt but uh well of course we can i should have told you before this episode this even though we don't a, work uh, any more goals so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. all right philippe um i think yes. we've covered a lot of ground here and yes. i would very much like to thank both of you for coming on the program uh, I know it's it, it's a lot of work. You're probably very busy with the startup. So Gilad, Daniel, thank you guys very much for coming on the program. I appreciate your time, your effort. It's very late, and you've probably been putting in a lot of hours. And that's all I have for you guys uh, in the audience. Philippe, would you like to take us out, sir? Yes, yes, that's fine. Okay, so Gilad, Daniel, thanks again for joining us. You'll have the last words before we wrap it up. But today we did a podcast with the Tesseract guys. Tesseract is a one of the companies that was chosen by the Emergo Accelerator program. So congratulations to both of you. It seems like it's a very prestigious program, and I wish you both a lot of success. And Rick and I, Rick Sebastian and I, throughout the entirety of the Cardano Effect podcast, we're always stressing this word mass adoption. And these are the guys that are gonna bring mass adoption to blockchain. These are, these are the type of ideas. And um, we were talking about it earlier and Gilad was saying something to the effect that people don't even need to know that they're using blockchain to be using blockchain. And that's when we hit that mass adoption. That's when the masses are going to be using it and it's going to be integrated within society and it's going to allow people to seamlessly interact and interoperate between the legacy system and decentralized systems of blockchain. So with that being said, thank you to both of you. You both have the final words. The floor is yours. Thanks again for joining us and floor is yours. Thank you guys a lot for inviting us. It was a heck of a surprise to see an email like, listen, guys, do you want to participate in Cardano Effect podcast? Wow, what? And uh, <laughs> well, uh, it's a pleasure. Thank yeah, you. it's uh, it's going to be remembered as a part of our program here in uh, New York. Yeah, yeah. It will, uh, I hope it will be a part of our story uh, in Tesseract. Uh, and uh, well, I hope uh, what we were talking about today makes sense. Uh, to the Cardano community and to blockchain community in general and uh, the values we want to bring. Uh, I hope there are people that share our values and uh, see the future at least in the same direction, share our dreams. I think Daniel uh, left me speechless. Uh, <laughs> I, I share the same, uh, I share the same, uh, I share the same feelings. Uh, I think it was, uh, first of all, it was an ama it's amazing opportunity. Uh, it, for me, at least, it's the first time in my life being uh, uh, in such an interview. And uh, I think uh, we also learned a lot from also from this uh, opportunity. 
and very true. Cool. Very true. For me, it's also still the very first time uh, I'm uh, in a podcast. So we are thankful. We we thank you guys, and we hope uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, Whenever you're in New York in the next uh, 12 weeks, let's grab a beer. <laughs> yeah, great idea. I'd <laughs> love to. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the program, guys. All right. Have a great Bye, day. Guys. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. 